Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Today, why your Amazon Prime video experience will never be the same. Then politicians are coming for nicotine pouch maker Zinn. It's Monday, January 29th. Let's ride. Okay, everyone, Toby and I need to come clean with you. We hadn't seen Oppenheimer until this weekend when we both saw it separately. It was so funny. I texted Toby, hey, you want to see Oppenheimer tonight? We probably should see it. And he responded, I actually watched it last night. So we are both fashionably late to the Oppie party. But Toby, I have to ask, when this movie came out, there was a lot of discussion around the parallels between the development of the nuclear bomb and our current environment with artificial intelligence. This idea that we are building a technology so destructive and powerful that maybe we shouldn't even build it at all. Was that going through your mind as you watch the movie? I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was not thinking about that at all. I was just trying to keep track of all the characters that were popping up on screen. There were so many characters in that movie. Every time Einstein came on screen, I immediately started applying. I'm like, I know that guy. I know him. So I thought it was a great movie. What also was interesting to me is that when I prep for the show, I listened to music on Spotify, and the soundtrack that I've been bumping was Oppenheimer. So I was going, oh, 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 I know that. So that was my two takeaways from the movie. It was a great movie. I saw it, uh, luckily, on the 70 millimeter IMAX in Lincoln Center, which is the way Nolan intended, and it just was a kind of full sensory experience, and I can totally see why he was like, you should go see IMAX, and I totally understand, too, because it was $30. It was a lot of money. It is interesting, though. This movie came out in July, but we, we're saying we're doing our due diligence because, you know, it's Oscar nomination season. Yes. We got we to gotta do our due diligence. Before we jump into the show today, we have a quick word from our sponsor, Veeam. I lost my AirPods last week, which was no bueno because I'm doing a lot of running these days. Can't be alone with your thoughts. Obviously not, Neil. But anyways, I found them on Friday in this very studio, and it got me thinking. That feeling of euphoria I got, that's how Veeam users must feel. I see what you're saying. Veeam provides fast and secure data recovery, so even if something goes wrong, you can get your data back. Exactly. Your business's data equals my AirPods. Both essential to keep things running. Head to veeam.com today to discover more. That's V-E-E-A-M.com today. There is a war going on right now over the fate of Zins, the ultra-popular ultra flavored nicotine pouches. Senator Chuck Schumer called for the FTC and FDA to investigate these tiny bundles of controversy last week for their marketing practices and health effects. And now a full-blown culture war has also broken out. As smoking and vaping have fallen out of favor, nicotine pouches have more than taken up the mantle. Nationwide sales rose dramatically in the past few years, with 808 million pouches sold in the first three months of 2022 alone. They become synonymous with the young, kind of college-age males who pop in a zinner or two during everything from a night out to a study sesh at the library. But Schumer is scared that Zinn is going down the jewel path and targeting youngsters with their marketing. Zinn is for 21 plus only, but a CDC survey last year found that 1.5% of middle and high schoolers had a Zinn in the past 30 days, while the rise of so-called Zinfluencers on social media also has health officials concerned. Some politicians have fired back saying this is a massive overreach by Schumer, while Major Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted, this calls for a Zinn surrection. Neil, Zinn's cultural importance has been surging, and now battle lines are being drawn. I don't think Chuck Schumer knew what he was getting into when he called out Zinn, because this has become very popular since the start of 2023 in particular online circles. I know when we scroll TikTok, we see some of these Zinn influencers promoting the product, but especially in right-wing in conservative circles, Zinn has become a symbol of a pick-me-up during the day and also a health alternative to tobacco. You have people as big as Tucker Carlson promoting uh, Zinn, and he had this big collab with this these YouTubers called the Nelk Boys in a video that promoted Zinn. They flew in a huge Zinn uh, package on a helicopter. That video has gained tens of millions of views. So I don't think Schumer realized how much Zinn is popular in uh, these particular worlds, and that has kind of sparked this culture war. It is interesting because Zinn has come out and say, hey, our marketing practice prohibit the use of social media influencers. They don't pay anyone to promote their product, but that doesn't mean that Zinn isn't reaching younger people. There are plenty of accounts that go all in on Zinn content. It is interesting because these nicotine pouches are 
less harmful than cigarettes. Nic nicotine is not considered a carcinogen, but it's still addiction is no joke. It is still a very addicting substance, right. especially when you are talking about teenagers whose brains are still being developed. They can just easily kind of fall victim to this addiction. Yeah. I mean, this is a crusade by Schumer uh, against nicotine, against uh, marketing towards kids. I remember last year he took on Prime, which is this energy drink with a lot of caffeine that probably kids should not be having. And that came from also social media influencers, KSI and Logan Paul. So uh, he is taking on uh, the tobacco and nicotine industry. The pushback on that is saying, look, you want to go after nicotine, but you're also at the same time legalize, want to legalize weed. How do you square that up? And that's been also a one of the, you know, one of the counterpoints that conservatives are pushing him back on. Yeah. And Zinn also for its maker, Philip Morris International, huge, huge yeah. money maker. I mean, they partially attributed, they, they brought in nine billion dollars in quarterly net revenue and they literally said it's due to quote the exceptional growth of zin in part so it is definitely like this money maker it's not just a flash in the pan thing like this is a very robust growing segment of kind of like the nicotine market and it's not going away anytime yeah. soon philip morris and a bunch of other tobacco companies saw the writing in the wall that you know tobacco cigarettes are kind of on the way out and they've invested a lot in acquisitions for vapes and these nicotine pouches so it bought zin in 2022 it's hoping to add two billion dollars in revenue from this particular segment so this is kind of like they're staking their business on this Okay, when you log into Amazon Prime Video tonight to catch up on Reacher, you may notice something different, commercials. Today, Amazon is turning on ads for all its Prime Video users, and if you don't wanna watch commercials, you have to fork over $3 a month. And because of Amazon's sheer scale, the inclusion of ads is expected to upend the streaming landscape and add billions to Amazon's top line with the flip of a switch. Analysts are estimating that Amazon could add $5 billion a year in revenue by putting commercials on Prime. And that estimate doesn't even include the people who want to avoid seeing ads. About 15% of subscribers are expected to pay up to stay commercial free, adding another $500 million in sales each year. Amazon is late to the ad game here. Netflix, Disney Plus, and other streaming rivals have already launched ad tiers, but Amazon has something they don't. Mountains and mountains of data on you from your Prime shopping account, which it can use to target you with very effective ads. In fact, we have never seen anything like this before in history. A company with the content and reach of television paired with the hyper-specific targetability of a tech company. Toby, if I'm Netflix or Disney or Peacock, should I be scared? Amazon is going to swipe some of my advertisers. Yeah, I mean, you got to be a little nervous. I mean, remember, Amazon is low-key one of the biggest advertising businesses in the world. Their revenue topped $12 billion in the third quarter of last year. They only trail Meta and Google in terms of the advertising. You don't even think about Am Amazon as this advertising behemoth. I think people, when they log into the Amazon marketplace and see all the ads, that is I mean, true. I don't know if they're thinking, oh, Amazon is making $12 billion a quarter from this, but I think they, they understand that Amazon has has a big ad business, but they also, you know, reach, they have 168 million Prime subscribers. If half of those watch Amazon Prime video, then that's equivalent to the U.S. subscriber base of Netflix. Yeah, it is just a massive, massive customer base. You you mentioned, should they be nervous? I do think that there is some drawbacks to Amazon's Prime foray into this world because a lot of these brands, not necessarily, they don't want performance marketing. They don't want someone to see their product and immediately go buy it on Amazon. There are other brands that are looking for more um, just awareness, stuff like Chipotle or Allstate, like these insurance companies. They don't want someone to go buy insurance. They just want to be top of mind share. And these advertisers have kind of stayed away from Amazon a little bit because they don't have the premium content offerings that some of these other brands do. I mean, Reacher has done well. The boys have done well. But Amazon still is kind of lacking in terms of like premium A1 content. So that is something that industry exec or vets have kind of said, all right, maybe they're not going to take over as much of a market share as we think they might. Yeah, um, someone wrote this in The Hollywood Reporter, and I thought this was probably the best way of encapsulating what's happening in the broader streaming landscape, is if the past few year years were about seeking subscriber scale, which is acquiring all these subscribers as fast as possible, losing a lot of money, the next five may be defined by who can build the biggest streaming ad business. I think we are seeing that with Netflix getting into ads, with Amazon flipping on a switch and turning on ads that 
that these companies see what saw what happened in television. They're like advertiser advertising supported cable TV for so long. Why don't we bring that over to streaming? And we're seeing the two uh, the two TV worlds kind of become ever closer together. I mean, the jokes write themselves. We are reinventing cable once again. Let's move on. AI deepfakes were in the headlines once again over the past few days. This time, a crop of AI augmented fakes targeting Taylor Swift and legendary comedian George Carlin popped up around the internet, demonstrating the complications that come along with diving headfirst into the AI age. X started restricting searches for Taylor Swift on the site after a series of explicit AI-generated images of her began circulating last week. Prior to X taking action, Swifties had actually called on each other to flood the platform with real pictures of Taylor to overwhelm search results and bury the graphic ones. Eventually, accounts spreading the images were suspended or banned. Meanwhile, the estate of George Carlin sued a podcast last week after they used what appeared to be AI to impersonate Carlin's voice for a fake comedy special. The podcast host allegedly trained an AI on five decades of Carlin's work, then released the special called George Carlin, I'm Glad I'm Dead, and posted it on YouTube. Neil, here are back-to-back -back instances of AI deepfakes being used without the consent of parties involved. This problem is not going away anytime soon. No, let's, let's start with the Taylor Swift thing, and I think the main takeaway for me was that this is happening to regular people every day and it only comes to our attention when someone like taylor swift is being subjugated to it but a 2019 study of deep fakes found that 96 percent of the ai generated fake images were pornography and 99 percent of them targeted women this is happening every single day across the country across the world targeting women and no one, you know, we don't really know about it. When it happens to Taylor Swift, it calls, you know, there's obviously a huge spotlight on it. People rallied to her defense. But there were a bunch of lawmakers who came out after these all went viral on X and said, like, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. This is just because we, we, we're seeing it because it's Taylor Swift. But this is happening all around the world. Right. The more insidious side of this is when it happens off of social media, not in, like, the public eye, in group chats. We've covered high schoolers on this show before where their classmates were making explicit images of them. So you're absolutely right that that's happening. I think the issue in these particular instances, which is differs from the issues we spoke about last week when, remember, robocallers were using AI to impersonate Joe Biden and meddle with the New Hampshire primaries. That was an a issue where people didn't know that they were being duped. They didn't know they were being tricked. In this instance, people understand, like they are aware that these are fake, but how do you stop the distribution of them? So it's kind of like a two-sided thing. How do you initially train people to recognize, then how do you eventually stop the distribution? And it's very, very hard to stop the spread on, on these platforms. It does uh, call to mind that when Elon Musk bought X uh, a couple of years ago, he kind of gutted the content moderation team. And that was certainly pointed out in this instance where X said, you know, they were, they were certainly behind the ball. These images racked up tens of millions of views in 17 hours and the Swifties say look X wouldn't have even done anything if we didn't you know rally our army to to kind of make the statement and and uh, figure out a way to stamp these photos out and bring attention to it X was X was like completely you know behind the ball behind the ball so I think you know certainly people will point to Elon Musk's gutting of the X staff to say like yeah it's already hard to stamp out deepfakes and then when you cut 80 percent of your workforce and take out all of the content moderation teams it makes it that much harder all right before we jump to the next part of our show we're going to take a quick break welcome to our winners of the weekend our monday tradition where toby and i pick two people or things that are waking up feeling extra refreshed this morning i won the pre-show air guitar competition so i will go first and my winner is Boeing. Yes, I know. Odd choice. It's been a rough go for Boeing to start the year. Earlier this month, a door plug flew off a 737 MAX 9 Alaska air flight, resulting in the grounding of that plane and turning Boeing into a punchline. Still, the company did take the first step in putting this debacle behind it because the 737 MAX 9 is back in the air again. After getting the all clear from the FAA last week, Alaska flew its first MAX 9 since the incident on Friday, and United sent its first one from New Jersey to Vegas on Saturday morning. In a show of confidence, Alaska's COO was on that first flight back and sat in the seat next to the door plug that had come undone. Boeing still has a lot of work to do to repair its reputation and regain trust.
trust from the aviation industry and the public. I'm sure many people have become a lot more familiar with where on an airline's website you can find the plane you're scheduled to be on, which is understandable. Boeing is hoping that anxiety will dissipate over time as these things start flying more regularly. Yeah, the big winners here are Alaska, because remember the, the groundings of these planes impacted 20% of its fleet. Also United, they had a fleet of 79 Boeing 737 Max 9. So these two airlines are just probably happy that they can have their full strength fleet back. Also remember though that Boeing 737 Max 9 may have gotten cleared to re resume flight, but uh, the FAA is still not approved it for increasing the rate of production. So this was supposed to be like their big money maker, their big plane that was going to fuel profitability and they're still kind of being hamstrung with how many they can produce yeah so people are definitely wondering uh should i get on a 737 max 9 how can i find out and i just want to be clear that alaska and united are the two that two carriers in the united states that fly it that said uh aviation experts quoted in the articles we read said Look, you may be nervous about the Max 9, but it's probably super safe considering it's the air, it's the plane that was inspected the most recently of any plane in the world. Like someone did a full body scan of the 737 Max 9 probably a few days before you flew on it. So they tried to caution people and say, I know you're nervous, but literally this is the most recently inspected plane in the aviation universe right now. Yeah, that's a good way of, of looking. That made me feel better, so thank you for that. My winner of the weekend is the color red because the red San Francisco 49ers and the red Kansas City Chiefs won their respective matchups and are now heading to the Super Bowl where a certain singer with a famous album called Red will once again be in the spotlight. All I can say to everyone at home is get ready. American Airlines has already announced new flights between Kansas City and Las Vegas where the Super Bowl is taking place. The flight numbers, one is listed on the site as AA-1989 in reference to Taylor's album, while the return flight is AA-87, Travis Kelsey's jersey number. Neil, are we ready for the two monocultures of America, football and T-Swift, to collide on the biggest possible stage? Or is Brock Purdy and the 49ers going to rain on the parade? I think a lot of people kind of want to bury their head in the sand yeah. a little bit right now. I, I know most of America was rooting for Detroit. It was such a good story. They had never been to a Super Bowl, decades of playing. And it was very interesting to see how that their Detroit Lions run it was kind of revitalizing the city that went bankrupt in 2008 very uh 2013, I'm sorry, very notably, and it was providing this jolt and enthusiasm. So I'm I'm very more more than happy for these two teams. I'm more sad for Detroit because that would have been such a good Cinderella story and maybe t maybe drove some of the storylines that we all have to bear for the next two weeks ahead yeah. of the Super Bowl. I feel so bad for the Lions because transparently, I had a whole segment prepared about exactly what you said, how it was revitalizing the city and all this, and then slowly as like the 49ers came back and won, like I said, oh no, we're going to have to change it up here, but I mean, the real winner is, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this, this, even though people are saying that they are tired of this Super Bowl already, they don't want to see these two teams, this is going to rip in terms of, of viewership. I mean, remember, Chiefs versus Bills in the divisional round, 50.4 million viewers. So I'm going to call it now. We are setting an all-time viewership you think record. So? I think so. Well, well, what's surprising? First of all, Niners get no credit, but they're an amazing team. And the Chiefs are going for their second straight Super Bowl. No team has won the Super Bowl back-to-back -back since the 2004 Patriots. It's the, the Chiefs have been in the Super Bowl four out of the five past years. They are an absolute juggernaut, but they aren't getting any respect this year because I checked the Vegas line this morning. The 49ers are favored by two and a half points. Thanks for uh, getting up to date <laughs> statistics on that, Neil. That is that is who. So who we tailing? Chiefs. <laughs> he said it here first. Let's move on. Tax season starts today, so little PSA out there for everyone listening who might have blocked this day from their minds. But we're not here to ruin your Monday. We actually want to talk about the IRS's new tax filing site called Direct File. Initial reviews are in, and it's already got two massive advantages. One, it's way better than dealing with paper tax forms, and two, it's free. But is it a turbo tax killer? Probably not yet. The main issue is that it's not widely available this year. It's only open to a very small group of test users in 12 states this filing season. But the eventual goal is to provide a free government-run alternative to the for-profit behemoths run by TurboTax and H&R Block. Right now, the software is good for only the most basic of tax returns. So think more first full-time job in Florida and less 
owns multiple shell companies in the Cayman Islands. Neil, this is the first year of a potentially game-changing piece of free government design software. Should people be excited for this? Uh, it's tough to say. This is such a small pilot, and I think people are excited because they look at what happens in other countries, and the tax filing system is so much easier than it is here, where often you have to go through third-party services that charge you a lot. So, But I just want to, I just want to say that this is a very sort of rudimentary pilot test, 12 states only for public gov public sector workers. So in my mind, I would just kind of make believe like it doesn't exist and focus on how to, you know, maximize your returns with the existing system, but just and understanding sort of what's different this year, what has changed, and uh, kind of just leave that to be, and maybe, you know, you'll get a little birthday surprise in a few years. Yeah, stuff it can't really deal with as of now. Gig income it can't take into account retirement account distributions. It doesn't, it's not live in most states, so like Illinois, Oregon, all these other states. And also, if you've attained $1 of through dividends or capital gains income, can't deal with that. So again, it has a lot of shortcomings. I also just want to zoom out onto some of the other things this tax season that might impact your return. Uh, remember, there's this big tax package making tax package making its way through Congress right now. If it passes, the child tax credit could be expanded. It temporarily enables lower income families to claim more of their credit on their 2023 returns. That same package would increase how much small business owners can write off the purchase of new equipment. So this pa tax package actually will have long-reaching uh, impacts if it does pass. So right. So, uh, yeah, lawmakers wanted to get it done before today, but uh, <laughs> clearly that did not happen, which is not a surprise. So they're saying if you think you might qualify for any of these new uh, tax exemptions or refunds that uh, lawmakers are considering, you might want to hold off because they're going to make it retroactive to the 2023 tax year, and it will apply to this year. And as we know, uh, you know, tax season extends till April 15th, which I'm sure a lot of people will avail themselves of. So so they're saying it like take a look at what this uh, this bill might include. If you think it applies to you, maybe just hold off uh, a little bit longer. But I would say if you don't, uh, if, if this doesn't apply to you, don't hold off because the faster you file, the faster you get your refund. About two thirds of Americans got refunds last year. The average came out to more than thirty two hundred dollars. And the IRS says it will process your it will give you your refund if you select direct deposit and file electronically within 21 days. It's news you can use, Neil. I mean, don't, don't wait, yeah. Don't wait, uh, but I did find this thing funny. So April 15th is, the, is, we know, is tax deadline day, but it's not in Maine and Massachusetts because Massachusetts, as we know, has Patriots Day, and Maine has Emancipation Day, so they, de they delay it a little bit. You don't you don't grow up in Massachusetts. Yeah, I didn't know Patriots that. Patriots Day. Patriots Day is <laughs> mar big deal, I guess. You know, Patriots Day is marathon day and when the Red oh, okay, Sox play okay. at 10 a.m. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. with the red uniforms. Okay, moving on. It is Monday, which means I'll run through the biggest events you should know about this week. First, a couple of big tests for the stock market, which hit multiple all-time highs last week. The first test is this busiest earnings week of the season, with more than 100 of the S&P 500 reporting. That includes five of the magnificent seven stocks: Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. Amazon, Meta, and Alphabet, and I advise you against taking a shot every time AI is mentioned. Boeing, maybe the company under the harshest spotlight right now, as we talked about, will also report earnings, as will Starbucks, Pfizer, GM, and big oil companies like Exxon and Chevron. I'm not that excited about big tech because AI is not the shiny new thing anymore. So like last year, it was kind of fun to hear about new advancements. This year, it's a little passe. I'm interested in big oil because just to see how they feel about all these trade disruptions, geopolitical instability. So that's who I'm actually most eager to see their earnings. That's a good point. The other tests for the market are the first Fed meeting of the year on Wednesday and the first jobs report of the year on Friday. As for the Fed meeting, Chair Jerome Powell is expected to keep interest rates unchanged this time around, and investors will be more focused on whether he thinks a rate cut will come in March. And on the jobs front, U.S. employers are expected to have continued hiring at a brisk pace in January, despite all the high-profile layoff, layoff announcements we've discussed on the show. Man, can you imagine if Jerome goes off book and cuts rates? Absolute boondoggle right there. He doesn't. It's not going to happen. The whole point of the Fed is to be like – as signal, you know, as clear as possible about their signals. But I think, you know, whether a rate will, cut will come in March or after that will definitely determine uh, the course of the markets because, as we know, the markets have hit all times highs and are surging primarily because of these uh, the expectations that we're about to cut rates. And that would be sort of the end of the soft landing question and be like, yeah, we did it.
Okay, next, all those next strengthening exercises are about to pay off because Apple's first Vision Pro headsets will be available in stores on Friday. Apple began accepting pre-orders for its $3,500 spatial computing devices earlier this month, and they sold out almost immediately. Analysts expect Apple to ship between 300,000 and 400,000 units this year in a major test of demand for high-end metaverse hardware. Toby, this is Apple's first product launch in about a decade. It's hard to overstate how high the stakes are. I hope that they come to Apple stores and then allow you to go there, put them on and try them on. I've heard that they're just so heavy. Like you mentioned the neck exercises and it's not even a joke because people say after 20 minutes, 15 minutes, their necks are actually hurting. So, but I'm certainly going to go and try. That was the best part about Apple stores. You could play with all the new devices. Now we got a new one to play with. Toby's got a new playground. All right. February and Black History Month will start on Thursday. Remember, it is a leap year. So February is 29 days. It's Groundhog Day on Friday. God, I swear it was Groundhog Day already. The 12th and final season of Curb Your Enthusiasm premieres on HBO on Sunday. And I love the show, but I think it's time for it to go. Should I start watching? Now seems like a pretty good time. Absolutely. All right, let's do Great it. Great show. Okay, it's also Groundhog Day on Friday. God, I swear it was Groundhog Day already. All right. Uh, award season rolls on with the Grammys on Sunday. I did not know this, but they will take place in the Sphere in Las Vegas. First Sphere Award show. I am so pumped. Let's go. The first of many. All right, we have to wrap it up there. Hope you all have a great Monday and start to the week. If you have any thoughts on the show or just want to say good morning, please write to our email, Morning Brew Daily at morningbrew.com. Let's roll the credits. Emily Milliron is our editor and producer. Raymond Liu is our associate producer. Yuchenua Ogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. Hair and makeup is setting an example for us all and has already filed their tax return. Devin Emery is our chief content officer and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow.